rođen je u Izraelu, a filmske studije završio je na Univerzitetu u Njujorku. Nakon 21. godinu napušta poziciju izvršnog producenta u Izraelskom filmskom fondu. Za vrijeme upravljanja ovim fondom Katriel Šori producirao je više od 150 filmova i televizijskih programa, a podržao i promovisao njih više od tri stotine. Mnogi njegovi filmovi dobitnici su vrijednih evropskih i međunarodnih nagrada, a čak četiri su nominovana za Oscara. Smatra da se iz malo novca mogu snimiti velike filmske priče. Za Al Jazeera otkriva tajne međunarodnog uspjeha izraelskih filmova uprko s jezičkim i financijskim preprekama. Mr. Shori, welcome to Sarajevo and to Al Jazeera Balkans program. Hi, happy to be here. Um, recently you stepped down as an executive director of Israeli Film Fund. You've been managing the fund for 20 years, over 20 years. Can you tell us more about the Israeli Film Fund? Well, the Israel Film Fund, um, first of all, I would say that the Israel Film Fund was established as an NGO. I managed an NGO, which means a non-government organization. Uh, it's true that the money that we received was public money. But we were completely independent and we reported, I reported only to my board of directors and that's it. So we were not a government agency all throughout the years, which allowed me and allowed us to have a complete creative freedom, which for me was an absolute must. Otherwise I wouldn't have taken it upon myself. Because before that I was 25 years an independent producer. I was very happy being an independent producer. But actually I answered the call of the industry that actually asked me if I'll be ready to take upon myself the management of the fund at the lowest point in the history of Israeli cinema. And I said I'll do it. Uh, but um, so basically the Israel Film Fund has been like the main funding body of full length narrative feature films, which is this was my charter. We got a chance to see eight uh, Israeli movies during Sarajevo Film Festival. One of them is a uh, co-production uh, and funded by IFF. It's Waltz, uh, Waltz with Bashir. Can you tell us more about the, the movies, the kind of movies, the stories that Israeli Film Fund finances? The stories came from all over. Basically, we selected from what we received. I, we never, I never raised a flag saying we are looking for this type of stories or any other type of stories. We let everybody and all the filmmakers to run with the dreams and the hopes and what they would like to tell. And we selected from what we get. We didn't have any agendas whatsoever and we just looked at the pure mm, cinematic merits of the project presented to us. And this was for me a very clear guideline all throughout the years. So basically I cannot say that we had a specific line. It's true that in few years here and there I made a deliberate decision in order to lift what's called genre film, films for children, comedies, romantic comedies, which I never hardly got all throughout the years, unfortunately. But basically, other than that, it was really what we received. Basically, I was able to give a positive answer to an average of seven, eight percent of all the submissions. It was tough, but we went with what we really believed, me and my selective selection committees, which I changed the committees every year. So it was not that there was a bunch of guys with me all throughout the years with a certain taste. It was all the time like this. And basically, it seems that we did the right selection, at least in part of the times. How do you operate? How do you find those movies? We issued three calls a year to the industry. And people submitted the scripts, the projects, and when I say people, it means a director and producer already attached. So we received projects which were already developed or in the stage of development, and then we received it by the producer and the director. They came to us, they submitted the project, the script still on paper. We read all those scripts and we made a selection out of them and then we decided how to finance and how much to finance. And we finance quite a lot, you know, that my, I could invest almost half a million euros in the top uh, amount and then as low as 50,000 euros. So we looked at the projects, we looked at the needs, we talked with the filmmakers, and this is how we decided how much to invest. 
So what does it take to uh, have a successful filmmaking? How important it is to have this creative collaboration between a producer and a director? First of all, the, the, the story has to come from a real need. If you, people have to ask, them, why is this a story that can really turn into a film? Why does this story matter to me? How much do I care about the story? Do I have something to tell? Do I have something to say? Do I have something to say and tell? You have to ask yourself this question before you come to ask, to ask for money. That we invested a lot. I mean, and in, in a country like Israel, like I guess, like here and other places, without this public support, there was no way of making a movie. So we were like the first door that everybody knocks on. And then came the other investors. But we were an investor, and we looked to make our investment in stories that really matters, really matters. This is the point. Matters and stories that really touch and move the audiences. That's it. But most of the movies that you finance are in Hebrew language. Uh, is this an obstacle when you're negotiating on international market where we mostly have English-speaking films? Well, the bottom line is that uh, if I look at my 21 years, we made it four times to the final five in the foreign section in the Oscars in Hollywood, which is not bad at all. We got Golden Lions, Golden Bears, all of that, and all these films were in the Hebrew language. I believe that if you come with stories from your own backyard, but if there are strong and powerful stories, and we come from regions that we have very strong and powerful stories, and if you tell them in an engaging way, in a way that it's professional, it's cinematic, but it's also moving and touching, and lets you think and so on, you can cut through, and it doesn't have to be in any foreign language, but in your own language from your own backyard. But Israel is a small film market. There, is no, uh, there are no bankable stars, as you call them. Uh, so basically, it's uh, usually the same professional actors in, in, in the movies. So you have to be additionally creative in order to fundraise, to attract the funds. It's true that we don't have a star value, but I think that in the kind of stories that we make, the art house type movies, the element of stars don't really matter. Uh, what really matters is the strength of the story, and we had like a very wide range of actors and some of them emerged throughout the years. And it's true that the actors in a small country like us, the main business is theater. Cinema or TV series comes as an extra. So their main income, their main job was theater. But altogether, I hope that we had, I believe that we had a very strong group of uh, actors. And actually it shows also in the movies and so on. Basically for a small country like we are, with hardly nine million people. We managed to get into the cinemas in some of the films, 600,000 people, 700,000 people, which is quite a low bit for a small country. So altogether, we were doing quite well. And you know, when I had money to invest in about 12, 14 films a year, you can do a mixed bag. You can make films which are more, let's say, users friendly, but you can also make films which are a very personal stories and also you can make films which really stretches the film language and the film grammar. So we tried to do a kind of a mixed bag, but based on the project that we received. But what are the sources of financing uh, film industry in Israel? Uh, you, you mentioned public sources. Do you have to rely on co-production? No, not necessarily. The first door that everybody knocked on is in the fund because we are the first door. But once we decide to green light a project, the next door will be the broadcasters. And the broadcasters are obliged by law, the public television, the private TV, obliged by law, the satellite cable, to invest in Israeli feature films. So they are the second source. And the third source is really investors, some private investors, very few, but of course distributors and cinema owners who invested quite a lot. So basically, on a film with a budget of seven, eight hundred thousand euros, you can raise all the money in Israel without having to venture out into the world. But when we speak about co-production, who are your main partners? Our main partners, uh, well, first of all, I would say that Israel being what it is politically and so on, we are not part of the EU, we are not part of any regional stuff and so on, like the Balkans or the Baltics or whatever. So we had to look after ourselves in many ways. 
and our main partners were Germany, France, Poland, Italy, Canada, and we did quite a lot, and we even did a couple of co-productions with Australia, New Zealand, it's hard to believe, but it worked. Um, do you co-product with uh, the States? No, because as you know, the United States do, do not believe in um, co-production treaties. As you know, the United States is the only country in the world that they don't have a Minister of Culture or Ministry of Culture. They are completely independent on their own. It's a complete private, completely based on market, and the cooperation is very limited. And if also you look at most of the European films, you could hardly see any American money in it. But uh, is it true that France is the biggest investor in Israeli movies, that it, it even invests more in Israeli movies than Israel itself? How do you explain this? It's true that Arte, the television, Arte cinema, Arte, which is the German-French, French-German joint venture, there were periods in, in which they invested in Israeli feature films more than all the Israeli broadcasters put together. It is true. But it is a battle and it's a war that we had to go vis-a-vis -vis the broadcasters and at the end they were obliged to invest. Of course they like much more to invest in TV series and so on than Israeli feature films, but I think that now they are on, it's much more they have to invest. But there were certain times that uh, the Europeans invested a lot, mainly because of the strength and the power of the stories. The Israeli cinema is very strong, very powerful, very open. Uh, you know, we go all the way to the end. We kind of strip ourselves in our films, and especially films which are very autobiographical. If you ask like Vazir Bashir, what's the story of Vazir Bashir? It's the personal story of the filmmaker, of the director. And the same goes for other films like Lebanon, Foxtrot, and all those films which won many prizes. We are, are very strong, we are very open, we are very, and we have no problem dealing with our wounds and without things, and some of the films were extremely criticizing the state of Israel and so on. I came under endless attacks by the politicians. I had endless threats and so on, but we stood our ground and this is what we believed in. So what is the story of Waltz with Bashir? No, the story of Waltz with Bashir is really the story of the director who is here, Ari Fulman, and what he went through during the Lebanon war. And he had to get it out of his system. So, um, and I learned also that if a filmmaker makes a story which is very autobiographical, if it works, then it's very powerful. Altogether, I would say that the Israeli cinema is not heavily based on adaptations like the British cinema or the American. You'll see few films which are based on pieces of literature. Most of the stories come from the personal experiences of the filmmakers. And because we live in such a turbulent society, in a such a turbulent country with battles, wars, and you name it, and never a moment of rest, a lot of the filmmakers gain tremendous experiences, uh, life experiences that they bring into the screen. So when you go to negotiate you know, with the international investor to invest in Israeli movies, what is important for them? What is, in, what is important for international investor to invest? Well, what is important really is the cinematic vision. It's mainly the cinematic vision of the director, a very particular imprint. They want, and also the strength of the stories. Not all of the stories have to have a political angle. But of course, people expect from Israeli films to be films which deal with the main conflict in the region and so on. But not all of them, there were very strong films which made it extremely success in the world and had nothing to do with the main issues in the region. I can give you, for example, an example of the film called Divorce, Get, which was in France and made it really big, which had nothing to do with the politics, but it had to do with the strict religious rules against divorces and so on and so on and so on. And it was extremely powerful and successful. So what do investments and equity investments depend on in general in Israel? I think that most of the investors, what they wanted is to be attached to a powerful filmmaker with a powerful story that hopefully will make it to the red carpet in Cannes. What would be emerging markets for Israeli film fund? Uh, you know, after 20 years, the landscape has changed. 
Is IFF more open now to other countries? The IFF has been open all throughout the years. My main thing was that I wanted to reintroduce the Israeli cinema to the world. If there's one mark which I left after 21 years is to get the Israeli cinema into the world. And I must say that in throughout my 21 years, almost 80 million euros were invested in Israeli films in terms of co-production. 80, 80 which I never believed in my wildest dreams that it will happen. So it means that there was a certain trust in the talent, a certain trust in the strengths and the power of the stories. And I think that the Europeans wanted to be attached to this particular talent. Let's face it, when Vazen Bashir was in the official selection in Cannes, the head of the German Berlin Film Fund was walking with me on the red carpet and it was her film just as it was our film because she was a major investor in this film. And the same was for Ajami and for many other films that we had all those people. And for them, they were attached to a strong talent and this was very important for them. But talking about emerging talents, you're also a consultant and a mentor for uh, young professionals, generations. Microfinancing and low budgeting is the business model that you actually teach and you recommend especially for small markets. Can you tell us more about this model? Yeah, because you know, for me, when I look at the filmmakers, you know, because they are, it's very hard to put together the pieces of the puzzle. It's very hard to get the financing in place. Sometimes directors are waiting three, four years until all the pieces of puzzle come together. And this waiting, it's a, it's a terrible situation. Basically, it's endless waiting for answers from investors and answers from funds. In the meantime, life goes by. So I introduced this micro-budgeting element, this micro-budgeting thinking, saying, while you are waiting for the big money to come in, Try to develop and write a script in which you hang the story on two, three characters, in which the story takes place on one or two locations, that you can make the whole film for 100,000 euros. Because what we are facing, and this is a great thing, that because of the technology, it created a complete democratization of the process. So you can take a small camera, you can take editing, you can do it almost on your own, but do break the waiting, just wake every morning and go and do. This was my main objective, and this is what I'm trying to tell the guys. While you are waiting to put together all of that, write something. In other words, you cannot think, you have to develop a story which is not horizontal, which is vertical, which really you hang the story on two, three characters in a couple of locations, but you do, you do, and you don't wait forever. And while managing uh, Israeli Film Fund for over 20 years, you also developed four best practices to promote the films on domestic market. So what are they? <laughs> now, first of all, I think that we... I thought that we have to reach out to the regions. I thought that, you know, at the end it's the taxpayers' money and we owe something to the taxpayers. And we, had take to, we have to take our films to all the regions in the country. And we have to reach out to them. And we have to go with our films to them. So we developed a whole system which was an auxiliary market to the traditional cinema going in the art clubs, in cultural centers, in many other places, just that people will come. We organized the, all kind of things that they will get special, uh, and special the tickets with special prices. And then I pushed in the parliament, this is true, uh, I pushed in the parliament a law in which all the senior citizens can go seven days a week, wherever, whenever they want, and see an Israeli film in half price, 50%. And I did many other initiatives like this in order to reach out to the audiences, because at the end of the day, the politicians, what they want, it's very nice, Cannes, Berlin, Venice, but at the end they want to know that their own taxpayers, their own voters, are going to see Israeli films. Uh, talking about politics, just for the end, your movie, Beyond the Walls, uh, it, won, yeah, it won the prize of Venice Festival in 1984 when it was produced. It's a story about Arabs and Jews in jail. The common thing is the corrupted systems they both come from and the hate they have for each other, which they brought beyond those walls. So after four decades now, do you think anything changed, at least on a micro level, culture-wise, 
between these two? No, but beyond the walls, we won the Critics Award in Venice, and also we were in, in the final five in the Oscars in 1984, Hollywood, Red Carpet, you name it. I came under huge attack by different groups in the country. We had to change our office in Tel Aviv a couple of times, but the story was actually that if we will not hang together, we will hang separately. At a certain point, the Palestinian in the prison, in the Israeli in the prison, understood that if they will not be together, vis-a-vis -vis the management of the prison, they will hang separately. So it started as a conflict, but at the end, it's the management, it's the authority, and both sides understood that they have to cooperate and they will have to stick together. To tell you that it's happening today, no. To tell you that uh, things have improved, no. My personal view, things, the situation nowadays is worse than it was in 1984. But it was a very daring film, and it was publicly funded by the same fund that later on I managed. And, uh, and it was a daring film in which uh, we have came at the huge attack by politicians and so on, but we stood our ground, and you know what? More than one million tickets were sold in Israel for this film. Mr. Shori, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you.